stocks, bonds, ETFs, straight out of downtown Chicago. This is Zach's Market Edge. Welcome to Zach's Market Edge, the podcast about investing in your life. I'm your host, Tracy Reinick, and this week I'm joined by a new guest, Andrew Rocco, who is a stock strategist here at Zach's. He just joined us here And so this is his first appearance on the Market Edge podcast, and I'm glad, as I know all of you are, to have some new guests on the podcast, some new blood, some new insights, and we're going to talk about growth stocks today, specifically the Fang Man plus Tesla. I always add the Tesla in on that group now. Are they back? I thought they were dead. I thought it was over last year. We didn't have to talk about Fang Man ever again. But maybe not. Maybe growth is seeing a resurgence here in 2023. We know some of them are. And maybe we were a little bit quick in saying it was over for the growth stocks. So welcome to the podcast, Andrew. Hi, Tracy. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm uh, excited to be here for my first Zach's podcast. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm glad you're here because as people listening know, I am the value stock strategist at Zacks and I run the value investor portfolio at Zacks. So growth is not my thing, and but it is yours. So I was glad to hear that when we were discussing what we could talk about on this podcast. And I, you know, I'm confused with what's going on with growth uh, this year. Can, you know, what, what is happening? Can you fill us in? Yeah, I would say that when we have a correction like we did in 2022, I think that all growth stocks are going to get hit and they're going to get hit more than the market. So in an up market, for example, I think they tend to move about three times the market to the upside on average, three times the S&P, for example, the, the Teslas of the world, the Microsofts and, and Googles of the world. And then unfortunately for growth investors like myself, if you get caught on a losing trade, it's going to do the same thing when those valuations compress. And then that's when a value trader like yourself or a value investor is really going to outperform to the upside. So in my view, the market kind of goes in cycles. I I think the last 10 years has been more uh, oriented towards growth. Um, growth has outperformed. With that said, of course, there have been value winners, uh, but 2022 was definitely a standout year for value type investors like an AQR or a, or a Warren Buffett. Those type of investors are going to outperform um, when those valuations are coming down and, and valuations become more important in a market like that, in my view. Yeah, for sure. So what does that mean Um for 2023, though, because valuations of the growth stocks did come down. I know Meta at one point was trading around 13 times forward earnings, but it's not anymore. It's trading at 18.9 times because the shares are up 54% year to date. So it's not, that's still not, you know, nosebleed levels by any means, but it's not as cheap as it used to be. And then looking at a couple of the others, obviously, uh, Amazon still remains on the Fang Man, the most expensive at 70 times. But a lot of people will argue it it never got much below 50 ever. And then you had um, NVIDIA at 52 times. So that's up there. It's up big, though, year to date, up 64%. And then if you add Tesla on there, they're now trading at 49 times. So um, have we seen enough of the uh, contraction in their valuations, you know, going yeah. into this year or, or what, what is, what's happening with the growth side on the valuation front? Yeah. So I would first kind of preface this with the fact that changes in interest rates tend to change how we look at, at PE and, and furthermore, High growth companies with innovative products, so think about a Tesla and NVIDIA, they typically command higher PEs because investors are willing to pay up for that growth. I remember when everyone was saying, oh, my God, Tesla is the same market cap as GM. GM has been in business since whenever they started, you know, hundred so years ago. Um, but, but what I think people were missing was that Tesla had 
that insane growth when they're still growing at about 50% a year, for example, uh, compounded. So I don't think you could just look at the raw PE. I think you need to size up the PE with the growth expectations. Now, of course, if, if the company does not grow at the rate that investors are expecting, again, it's going to get hit and it's going to get hit hard. Um, but I think that's what's happening is I believe valuations have come in enough. And the reason these stocks are still higher valuation relative to the market is because their future growth is expected to outpace uh, most of their peers. Now, some stocks like a AMC, for example, th- their valuation has come, o- come in a lot, and I don't think their future growth prospects are going to be great. So they probably have more to go. But the quality companies, which in my opinion are the, the FANG type stocks, I believe um, they've come down a lot. But I always like to have an if-then approach. So I'm I'm not just sticking my flag in the sand and saying, this is it, the lows are in, the PEs have come in enough. I'm going to have stop losses and, and risk management. And if the trades start to go against me, of course, I'm going to adapt with that. But I think that's what we're seeing right now uh, currently. So out of the Fang Men plus Tesla, obviously, they're all kind of different. Well, they are different. <laughs> um, they're all in different industries, even. We kind of tend to lump them all together. Oh, these kind of techie, you know, growth stocks, we'll just call them Fang Man, and they're all, you know, together. But they never have been. And certainly, even here in 2023, they aren't. Is there one or two out of the Fang Man plus Tesla that you like the story more for this year than some of the others? Yeah, I would say I, I would maybe give you three, but uh, Meta would right, be amongst amongst my favorite. Um, today, they just announced they had uh, two billion daily after active users for the first time ever. Uh, I think what yeah. hurt them a, a little bit more than people realize is the shift to the metaverse, where where Zuckerberg was piling in all of these resources to the metaverse, changing the name from Facebook to Meta. Um, I don't think that was great in in the short term, and I think it really uh, lowered the confidence of long term investors. They were kind of had this scattered plan going forward. Uh, but a couple things I like about Meta, um, they're doing stock buybacks, so they kind of are putting a floor in. They're dramatically increasing that stock buyback program. Um, they're seeing a ton of international growth in the Asia Pacific region uh, specifically. And then they have the new offering, which is Reels, which is like the short videos that you see on Instagram. It's sort of like a TikTok, but on Instagram. And that's becoming super popular. I find myself just scrolling through those. And I'm not a TikTok person, but I guess they found their way to Instagram. And now they suck me in that way. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I think the Reels portion is really interesting because they have not monetized that yet or they haven't fully monetized that. So I think if they can monetize that reels uh, properly, their growth is going to pick back up again on the social side. And then hopefully you'll see um, their earnings come in from the metaverse eventually. But that's sort of more of a a long term uh, perspective. Another thing I would mention is last quarter, they had that monster quarter. They beat Zach's consensus by about 40 percent and it's moved to a Zach's rank buy. Okay. One thing I like is when a stock gaps up on earnings and it has massive volume, especially a large cap like Meta, it gapped up about 20% on massive volume and it's kind of just moved sideways. So it, that tells me that there was institutional demand. I mean, you're not going to move Meta without institutional demand for, for 20%. It's just not possible. So there's a lot of institutional demand. And then even though the stock has moved up, it's just kind of held tight, which tells me there's not a lot of selling pressure after such a big move. So I would say that's that's uh, bullish from a technical perspective there. What's your what's your next favorite? Uh, I would say Nvidia is is my next favorite. They're the true market leader as far as growth and innovation in my view. Uh, they're at the forefront of growing industries such as crypto, gaming, and I think the biggest one is going to be AI. Um, yeah. For for example, on on the crypto side, even though you know Bitcoin has come down, some of these um, lesser known coins have have blown up. We've seen FTX. 
the good thing about NVIDIA is they're not selling the crypto itself. They're sort of selling the, the shovel to the gold miners, if you will. So if someone yeah. is mining Bitcoin, they're going to need NVIDIA. If someone's uh, looking to implement AI, they're going to be uh, needing NVIDIA chips. So the demand is, is really there, even though they saw a little bit of a, a slowing growth. I think they're starting to turn it around with the stock market and the economy. Uh, with that said, the stock's up like 10 weeks in a row now, so I, I wouldn't okay. personally be be chasing it. Of course, it depends on the, the time frame. Um, one thing I did notice actually earlier today, someone bought 600 of the June 2025 calls, so that's about 8 million in premium. So that's a pretty big bet on the long term. Of course, it's just one player, but I, I thought that was an interesting trade. And then another thing I would say is Dan Loeb, uh, famous investor, billionaire, he just took a passive stake in AMD. So they're seeing a lot of belief in the semiconductors. I think they'll start to out or continue to outperform. Uh, however, NVIDIA has come a long way in a short time, so I wouldn't be chasing it up here. I'd wait for a pullback or some consolidation. Okay, that's that's some good advice because I was wondering, like, should I get in here? It's up 64% year to date already. And it's not that cheap, but it does have the good outlook. As you mentioned, earnings expected to be up uh, 34% this year and then another 33%. So the analysts are super bullish on it, um, but it does seem a little stretched. Yep, exactly. And and I found that anytime I've chased a breakout in a momentum stock, it, it, it's rarely a good idea, especially when everyone is, is so bullish. So usually you have to keep investors honest, um, so to speak. Uh, so maybe they'll get a shakeout or a pullback and that will will give you some opportunity. But on these momentum stocks, it's tough to chase them because when they pull back, they can really pull back uh, quite hard. What do you think about Microsoft since you brought up the AI um, being, you know, a thing with NVIDIA. Obviously, it is a thing with Microsoft, but the shares initially got a bump on the news, but they're only up 6.6% year to date right now. They're not that cheap at 27 times, but is is this a buying opportunity in Microsoft for the AI reasons or or not? Yeah, so I think Microsoft is sort of going to be a market performer. Uh, and I okay. think the market is going to go up over the next year. So if I had to buy or sell, I would buy it. The problem with Microsoft is it's so large, it's really going to be hard to move the needle in the short term with the chat GPT, in, in my opinion. With that okay. said, I, I, I believe chat GPT, just from my personal experience using it, um, the hype around it, chat GPT is the quickest, I believe it's the quickest software to grow to 1 million daily active users. So it beat out, I don't know, MySpace, uh, parts of the internet, certain websites. So the growth, you can't deny that the, um, the, the product itself, they're still working on perfecting, but it's obviously already pretty powerful. But just that core business is already so large, you need to be able to move the needle. So that's why I'm just saying, I think it will market uh, perform. It's a big ship to kind of uh, move the needle in. Um, but yeah, the stock has regained the 200-day moving average, which I look at as a positive uh, from a technical perspective. What do you think about the fan favorite of Apple? It's always being talked about. Many, many people own it. Um, it just got an upgrade from Goldman Sachs for the first time since 2017. Uh, to a buy, but they have a new analyst there. So the the last analyst wasn't a fan of Apple <laughs> and and wasn't willing to rate him as a buy for all those years. But um, he's out of there. They got someone new in there who is joining the party. It sounds like, but you know, sales don't look that great for this year. Earnings don't look that great. You know, maybe flat to down a bit. And then kind of slowish type of growth going forward, but the shares aren't that cheap. But where do you put Apple in there? Because I know so many people are in it or want to be in it. Yeah, so I would actually put Apple above Microsoft. I don't think it's going okay. to bring you the, the biggest returns one year from now or two years from now, just solely because of the size factor like, like Microsoft yeah. suffers from. But um, moving beyond the analysts, I would say Warren Buffett owns 
$112 billion worth of Apple. Of course, he bought a lot of that lower, but he continues yeah. to buy it. So it's never a bad bet when, when Warren Buffett owns that much. I think it makes up about 42% of his portfolio over there at, at Berkshire. So yeah. uh, it's, it's a yeah. very consistent company. So even though the growth has slow, uh, slowed a bit, it's, it's not going to drop off too much because of their ecosystem. It's really tough to break away. For example, if you're in a group chat and someone has an Android phone, everyone kind of just shuns them. They're like, oh, you don't have the blue bubble or the green bubble, whatever it is. <laughs> right. And, and um, you know, you have your iStorage, you have your iMac. So it makes it really tough to move away from. Uh, I'm a yeah. PC guy from my computer, but I could never see myself getting rid of the iPhone for example. Uh, another thing is their stock buybacks. They're, they always are putting off a ton of cash and they continue to do massive amounts of stock buybacks, which in my mind puts in a floor for the stock. And with Warren Buffett okay. pushing that and him being such a big shareholder, I don't see that slowing down. Uh, also, they're super efficient as a company. They have a return. I had to double check this. They had a return on equity of 175%. So any cash they put into the business, they're getting massive returns on. They have a really efficient uh, business. So I would say outperform, but not going to be the, the top stock out of the, the bunch that we're talking about a year from now. Okay. What about some of the ones that are struggling a bit? Um, and I would put you know, Netflix in there, Amazon. Those are maybe the two biggies that you know have had. Well, Meta was struggling or maybe still is, but you know, that's, that was like last year and now it's rebounded, but Amazon keeps announcing, you know, they had the layoffs and then they keep announcing these kind of small little announcements that I'm not quite sure why they're, why they're even doing it. So I did hear even just today, I thought I heard Amazon um, is shutting down like eight of the Amazon go stores, but uh, they have more than that. So I'm not sure why they're not just shutting down all of them, but they're not. And then they they announced last week, I think it was, that they are pausing construction on the second building at their HQ2 headquarters there in Arlington, Virginia. Remember, they won the contest <laughs> along with Nashville, and then they built the first building apparently, and that is gonna open by the summer. But given layoffs and reduced hiring now, they you know, don't need the second building as quickly. So they're pausing, they, do, they did say they do expect to finish it, complete it. But this is a company that did over 500 billion in revenue last year. So I'm not sure, you know, whether or not they do or don't build that second building is even relevant, really. But, um, you know, some of this is showing that Amazon is taking the cost cutting seriously, I feel, because, you know, Jesse is just across the board on a lot of the retail side, especially, you know, all the all the bookstores were closed. Um, they had that other store that was selling like the popular products. I don't even remember the name off the top of my head. Those were all closed. They were building out the Amazon fresh supermarkets, but then that was kind of halted. And now they're not proceeding on some of those, but I'm not, I think the other ones are operating. Um, but it looks like that's kind of being cut back as well. And now we have the word that they're closing some of these Amazon goes. And um, so what do you make of an Amazon here? It's still trading at 70 times, but like I said, it's always been expensive. Um, and it's not, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's in some of these businesses that are really low margin, like it's Whole Foods, like the grocery stores, and maybe that's not the way they want to go. I don't know. What do you, what's your take on Amazon? Yeah, so I would... I would focus my attention for Amazon on AWS and the e-commerce business. I think the Go, okay. while that's not great to see, I think it's such a small part of the business that it, it won't really impact things. I would say that the reasons for Amazon's kind of downtrend over the last year and a half or so is, is really the economy and the stock market. You know, three and four stocks are going to follow the stock market. 
Uh, Amazon has come a long way since they kind of turned on that profit spigot. So the stocks run mm-hmm. a long way, even in the long term. If you look at a long term chart, it, it's ran so long. And then anytime you have an iconic CEO like a Jeff Bezos or a um, you know an Apple CEO when he left, it, it took a while. Uh, for for Apple to get its bearings again, so I think Amazon is kind of in that mode uh, where you know Apple had Steve Jobs leave, and then for a year it was like, is Tim Cook really the guy? Are they really going to get the business going? So I think investors kind of have one foot out the door as far as that goes. Uh, yeah. But from a long term perspective, I think Amazon is super attractive for a couple reasons. And you can talk more on the value part than I can, but the price to sales is the lowest since 2015. So that's pretty significant in my eyes. I think the economy might have made profitability maybe come down a bit. Um, The stock is coming into major support from a technical perspective. So it's super choppy if you look at like a short term chart. Um, But if you look at a longer term chart from 2018 to 2020, so a two year consolidation took place. And now we're pulling into that zone. So a big breakout zone, when we pull back to that, in my view, a big prior breakout tends to act as support, especially on these longer term charts. So I can't tell you what it's going to do today or tomorrow, but I would suspect six months, a year, two years from now, it would get support in that big zone. Um, And then, yeah, so those are kind of my main points for, for Amazon. Yeah, I own Amazon in my own personal portfolio, but um, I didn't buy it until um, AWS was actually like a decent amount of their business. And then I only bought it because of AWS. Like, I actually think they stink at the retail side, even as e-commerce. I mean, they're great at the distribution and delivery and all of that, but they could never make any money off that. Like, the margins still stink. (laughs) So, but AWS gave them the margins and good free cash flow. So that was like the genius business, basically. Um, exactly. So yeah, uh, it is it is a complicated company for sure. And uh, you know, we have to give Jassy a little bit more time to do what he's doing. And he just happened to you know take over right when things were slowing for off the pandemic. So he's dealing with the ramifications of that. Um, as you said, the price to sales ratio is extremely low. I am kind of surprised at what it's at. It's at 1.87 right now. So yeah. yeah, for any kind of these tech companies, that's really, really low. So um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, what about Netflix on the streaming side? We all know the problems all the streamers are having that it's just that's that's not a good business either. <laughs> like you, yeah. That's why I've never owned Netflix in my own personal portfolio. I have used it, and I think I've mentioned that I still I still get the DVDs, the red envelopes in the mail because yes, there are still some movies that are not streaming everywhere that Netflix will ship to me in the mail. But apparently, there's about a million of us who still get really? the DVDs. Yeah. <laughs> they um, actually did this whole thing on the 20th anniversary a couple of years ago of the red things because I didn't even realize this. Apparently, I was one of the more original, like early people <laughs> who is still having it. And so they were very nice to us. They were sending us all these emails, like, you know, celebrating the 20th anniversary of the red envelope and everything. Wow. Um, but the service is still there with the red, red envelope. You can get like all the movies, you know, it comes just as quick in the mail on the DVDs. But um, the flip side is I still get, I get the streaming too. And that, you know, they're, they're just having a lot of difficulties with, content generation, which is why I never wanted to own the stock. Like I don't like companies where they have to continuously come up with some kind of new content to keep you on board. (laughs) And this was always the problem I had with uh, a stock like Lionsgate, um, any of the movie studios, any of them, um, because, you know, you can have Hunger Games, and then the Twilight franchise. That was like phenomenal for Lionsgate. And they were like crushing it, but they went away. (laughs) Like you can only have so many episodes of it. And then they have to have the new 
Hunger Games, but that's not easy. You have to spend a lot of money and throw things up against the wall and hope something sticks up there and that you happen, you know, like Netflix did to get, you know, Bridgerton or HBO Max got the White Lotus, but they didn't know. Then they have to make five other White Lotuses that fail to get the one White Lotus and it all costs a ton of money. So what do you think about Netflix? Those That stock came way down used to trade at like 90 times earnings for forever. It is much cheaper now. Um, they raise prices to handle some of the costs, but what what is going on with the streamers or any of them? Like Disney, you know, what are the other ones? Warner or whatever that one is, um, mm -hmm. Paramount, right? So is this an area for the, the growth investors should they be in, in a well, Netflix? First off, I think if there's a Netflix executive listening, they need to sponsor your podcast due to your longevity. That's the first <laughs> point. <laughs> but in, in all seriousness, I, I'm in agreement with you. I think that, first of all, Netflix is my least favorite of the Fang names currently. As you okay. said, it's highly competitive. It, it's uh, yeah. capital intensive. We have HBO Max. Uh, I did like the recent Murda. If you haven't watched the I forget what it's called, but it's the, the documentary about oh, that the Murdoch case. That was yeah. fascinating. But again, they have to throw a bunch of these against the wall and, and hope one of them sticks. So it's not right. a, my favorite business. Um, the stock has already had a large move and it's breaking down below its 50 day moving average. So the technicals are not okay. ideal. Um, investors are not liking the price cuts. So they recently introduced those price cuts. And ever since then, the stock has been falling. So I like to take my feedback from the, the price action in the market and the, the price action in Netflix is telling me that they don't welcome those cuts. It could prove to be a right decision later on. But for now, investors are, are selling on that news. Um, I mentioned competition is, is heating up. And yeah, so if the stock has a deeper pullback, I think it would be attractive maybe for a bounce. And I think for the most okay. part, the FANG stocks are going to follow the market direction. But uh, against, let's say, a meta, it, it would uh, be my least favorite in, in the FANG uh, space. And the only other one in FANG man that we haven't mentioned yet is Google or Alphabet. And that one, I feel Alphabet, I own it in my own personal portfolio as well, but it's just, it doesn't really have a direction at the moment, I feel. Um, you know, it, it was a big winner during the pandemic once, uh, you know, everybody was at home watching YouTube, basically. YouTube was, became an incredible business during the pandemic, but even they are starting to feel the pullback in the advertising. And just people going out into the world and not not watching these things as often. And they just lost their CEO at, at YouTube. She's left. But they have um, put in there someone who's been at the company for many years. So I wasn't too worried about that. But then you have the AI uh, kind of debacle that happened in Alphabet. Right. And, and we do have the pullback just in advertising in general. And that's going to impact them for sure. Uh, you know, this year probably into early next year as well. Then we have the issue of they also have laid off people that they overhired. They've gotten or brought back, right? Sergey and uh, those guys, the original founders, are kind of back on the scene. So what does that mean? I don't know. What What are you thinking about Google? It's it's up this year, but only 7%. It is among the cheaper on a PE basis at about 18.6 times. Yeah, so I would agree with you. In the short term, that price action has been super frustrating in, in Google. I've, I've traded in and out of it a, a few times, but I think uh, Google, it's worth looking at from that longer term perspective. So in all of these names, really, the time frame is, is going to be important to consider for investors. If you have a different time frame from me, you might have a, a different opinion and we could both be correct. Yeah. But I think for something like an Amazon or a Google, it's really worth taking that long term perspective. Uh, one thing I would mention is when a stock is really choppy in the short term, what I like to do is zoom out from a technical perspective. And okay. uh, since inception, Google has, or Alphabet that they call it now, has tested its 50 month 
simple moving average five different times, and four of those times marked a major bottom. Uh, and the only time okay. that really undercut it significantly was 08. So right now we have that PE contraction, the valuation is getting super attractive, and we're at that longer term uh, buy zone. And it's got the lowest valuation since I believe the IPO at around 20 times earnings. So from a valuation and a longer term technical perspective, I think it's it's at a discount right now. And if you have, if, if you can withstand a little bit of short term volatility, I think it will pay off in the long term. Uh, from a, a kind of a company perspective, I believe those fears around the Microsoft chat GPT are a little bit overblown. Obviously, it wasn't a good look, but I think they can ultimately challenge ChatGPT. I think they have the, the data necessary and the experience, especially with the the original CEOs uh, coming back into play. So I think they're capable of creating a staunch competitor to ChatGPT, and I don't think that ChatGPT directly competes, at least at this moment, with Google. I could be wrong in the future as it gets better. Um, but for now, I think it's it's not in direct competition. So I think those fears are a bit overblown. So I like it from a okay. longer term perspective. And then, um, you know, I guess we'll we'll wrap it up by talking about Tesla, the addition to Fangman. It's up big this year, up fifty seven percent. They recently had an investor day where. I, I don't know what happened. Not much is what I, I gathered. I didn't watch the entire thing. I only saw the bits and pieces that were kind of shown out there, but they did not announce any kind of new car models. And they said that they will not be um, rolling out the truck this year, at least. So that was rather disappointing, but uh, they're selling a lot of whatever cars they do have out there. So what do you make of Tesla after this big rally? Yeah, and I like that you prefaced it with after this big rally. So it's up 100% in like two months to the underside of the 200-day moving average. So I wouldn't be falling out of my chair to, to chase it here. Uh, a okay. few months back, the oversold levels, I, I use a percent Williams R, but any of the oversold levels were at historic lows and the sentiment was really bad. Everyone was saying Tesla's going to 50. And so that was a little bit more attractive in my view. Uh, for now, I think it's 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 a wait and see. I think the company is still growing fast. In fact, no one is growing yeah. as fast as Tesla for that size. And what I like to say is for institutions, really, the magic elixir is when you have growing uh, growth like Tesla has are growing at 50 percent compounded and you have liquidity. And I watched that investor day and actually at the end of that investor day, uh, Will Danoff, who manages the Fidelity Contra Fund, which is one of the largest and most successful uh, mutual funds out there, he was asking questions and, and he seemed to like it. So I wouldn't be surprised if Contra Fund eventually takes a position. And when those guys take a position, it's it's generally like an elephant into the bathtub. They're they're getting into that yeah. stock for years. They're they're buying a ton of stock. So uh, from yeah. a short term perspective, again, I, like like Nvidia, I wouldn't be chasing here into the 200 day moving average after a hundred percent move, I would maybe give it some time, let it set up, maybe get over that 200, consolidate a bit. So I don't think there's a rush, um, but I would say one thing Elon says is uh, they always suffer from supply constraints rather than demand. So as long, as long as they can continue to ramp up their production, I think they're gonna continue to grow at a, at a rapid pace and they're also looking to vertically integrate uh, with lithium. So I don't think they've made right. any um, moves yet, but I think they were, I think the stock is SGML. They're looking at a, a few lithium stocks and, and if they're able to vertically integrate a little bit more, then they'll uh, be able to increase those margins over the long term. So um, I would definitely look for it to set up over the next few months, but I'm in no rush uh, at the current levels, I'd say. Well, that was a good uh, overview of the Fang Man plus Tesla. But what what should uh, people listening in take from you know just looking at each of these individual stocks like we just did? Some are up, you know, only five percent here year to date. Others are up sixty four percent year to date. Um, 
you know, what what should we be looking for for, you know, heading into the summer per se? Sure. So I, I would say a few things would be number one, um, know why you're in the stock that you're in. So as we talked about Google, for example, we talked that the valuation is super low. It's coming into that uh, really long term technical zone, um, but it's under its moving averages. It's choppy. So you have to know your time frame, I think, in order to be successful. And you have to know why you're in the stock. You don't want to just pick it because it's a quick glance and it looks good. You want to know the reasons behind it, and that's going to give you the conviction to hold it. The other thing I would say is you want to focus on the overall market direction. So I think that not you can never be certain where the market is going to go. In my view, um, due to a variety of different factors like sentiment, seasonality, breadth, um, markets like split government, which we have right now, and some of the technicals, for example, the S&P 500 is back above the 200-day moving average. So I, in my view, I would say the market is going to move higher over the next six months to a year. I could be wrong. So I'd say I like to have you know, high conviction, loosely held. Um, but if that's the case, three and four stocks follow the market direction. You, so you could expect most of these stocks to go. Which one you decide to be in um, depends on your personal preference preference and your investing style. But uh, those were yeah. would be some things I would consider. That's some good advice. Do you own any of the stocks in your own personal portfolio? I do. I own Tesla and NVIDIA currently. I'll probably be in a few more. Um, some of them I swing trade, and then I, I also have longer term accounts. So it really depends on that. But for me recently, there's been so much action in, in just the general market. So that's yeah. that's been Fun. There's been industrials have been great. Um, newer stocks like Airbnb are setting up with the gap up on earnings. Um, yeah. I've also ventured into some international stocks. So my favorite, maybe international and in stock overall, would be like a Mercado Libre, which is sort of the Amazon okay. of, of Latin America. Um, yeah. They have phenomenal growth. They're also quite attractive from a valuation perspective. So. Um, I, I do tr I like to trade the thing names because of the liquidity and they're never going to hopefully gap down, you know, 30 or 40 percent in one day. So they're, they're more stable than most other stocks, which is nice. Well, maybe I'll have to have you back on again so we can talk about the international stocks because we haven't really covered that that much on the podcast over the years because they have been so out of favor. Even, you know, well, we've, we've discussed the Chinese stocks, I shouldn't say that. So we have discussed some international stocks, but it was mostly, you know, Alibaba, JD.com, those, those types of stocks. We haven't really covered the rest of the world much. And suddenly it seems like international stocks could be the place to be in 2023. And there are some great um, growth names that you can be in that, you know, are outside of China that people might not be aware of. So I'll have to have you back on to Sounds talk about great. those. Yeah, so this is fun. Um, okay, so let's recap the tickers we talked about today. So there was Meta Platforms, ticker M-E-T-A, Amazon, A-M-Z-N, Netflix, N-F-L-X, Alphabet, G-O-O-G-L, Microsoft, M-S-F-T, Apple, AAPL, NVIDIA, NVDA, and Tesla, TSLA, and Andrew threw on Mercado Libre there at the end. And that one, in case you're just wondering, um, is M-E-L-I, M as in Mary, E, L as in Larry, I. And uh, in my own personal portfolio, as I mentioned earlier, I do own Amazon, Alphabet, and Microsoft. I used to own Meta. I owned it for nine years, but I sold it last year because I didn't want to own the Metaverse. So it had to go. Um, but otherwise, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode because when I have Andrew back on to talk about international stocks, you want to get it. So you can get us on Apple. You can get us on Spotify. We're on Amazon Music too. We're on several of these Fangman platforms. You can just Google us as well, and I'm sure you'll find the Zach's Market Edge and be sure to get us somewhere, but I'll see you again next week with some more stocks. 
This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.